You're listening to the Wheeler's Dog Podcast. This is episode 19. Hey, I'm Eugene Sims, and I'm trying something different on this podcast. I saw a bunch of guys that were, you know, doing their radio shows from home, and what they've been doing is putting a microphone, much like I've got, and putting it inside of a uh, cardboard box. So I, I tested it. I thought it sounded a little bit better. Maybe it will cut out some of the outside noise. I don't know, because if you listen sometimes with the ear- the earbuds, you'll hear like, Cars and big heavy trucks going up down the road by the house. And then sometimes you might hear the mill, you know, with their uh, uh, ruby work, you know, the Roomba. It might be over overhead just going to town, sweeping up debris, dog hair in the house. But uh, speaking of the mill, <laughs> we had a, I don't know, maybe it's cabin fever. I don't know what it is. Maybe something's going on that, uh, you know, we're just kind of getting under each other's hair, being here all the time. Well, last week, Jamie Chiggs decided to uh, take these uh, Gorton's Fisherman's fish fillets, right? Put them in the air fryer. I just bought them on a whim, you know. Some time ago, I was like, you know, I haven't had any fish fillets in a while. Let's give them a try in the air fryer. Didn't think about it. Then one day, a Saturday, I think, Chiggs put them in the air fryer. Put them on a bun with some uh, some mayo and some cheese, some sharp cheddar cheese. Damn, those things were good. So I bought two more packs this time around. So uh, Chiggs put them in the air fryer, right? Everything's cool. Everything's groovy. At least I, I thought it was. I'm sitting at the table, you know, kind of doing my shtick. Whatever I do when I'm sitting at the dining room table, which is now my office instead of the game room. And, um... There was like this hazy kind of smoke in the air, you know, in the kitchen. Just kind of hanging in the air. Not thick, just kind of, you know, like a a light fog. And so, um, I'm like, hmm, are the fish fillets burning? And just when I was thinking that, the mill stepped down from upstairs, which is like three steps. It's like a split level. And she stepped down and she's like, you reckon them, them fish patties are, are burning? I said, I don't know. And before I could even say go check, she'd already, you know, kicked into a, a, a lower gear to move a little faster on her way over there. And she gets over to the air fryer and she puts her hands on her hips and she says, well, they've got one more minute to cook. <laughs> I, I immediately just shot up out of my chair and like, well, open the door and take a look. You know, why would you want to keep something burning for another minute just because it's on the timer? I didn't understand that logic and I, I got a little frustrated. And, and of course, you know, she gave me that hurt, angry face. And before I could get over there, she she pulled it out and she says, they look just fine. I said, well, OK, just slip them back in. <laughs> so we think that maybe there was something cooked on there that kind of was burning maybe that was the case but uh you know that that sort of got that happened on friday and that sort of got on my nerves and then a little bit later okay when i do the grocery shopping on thursday like that's the supply run day you know for our uh our lockdown i'm the only one that goes out for supplies i'm the one taking the risk I'm the one grabbing her, uh, uh, her, her nicotine habit, you know, her electronic cigarettes. So that's what I do Thursdays and I get the shopping done. Well, when I come back with all the shopping, I take all the perishables out and clean them down. You know, because, you know, everybody's got their booger hooks all over the damn stuff in the stores you know somebody might pick up something and go i don't want this and then put it back and uh you know and then if people are using rubber gloves god knows what might be on those things because people think you know rubber gloves are just oh i can't catch anything with these 
but I sure as hell can spread things around. So I wipe all the perishables down, get them in the fridge. Then I let them sit for over 48 hours on the table. All the ones that are fine. Now, if you need something, by all means, go in there, grab what you're getting, wipe it down, and then go on about your business after you wash your hands. Well, apparently Friday it was just getting to be too much clutter on the uh, the table for her. And so she started putting things away. Now, keep this in mind. Let's say you pick up a can of soup. And let's say, for the sake of argument, that the whole can is contaminated with the COVID, right? COVID-19 is all over that can. So, here's what she did. She picked it up with her left hand. She got the wipe and started wiping the can. Then moved the can around with her left hand, putting her left hand in a place that she just cleaned off. And wiped down the other side and just kept doing that process. And I'm like, Linda, <laughs> please stop, stop. If, if it bugs you that much, let me take care of it. And she's like, what, what? And I was like, you're, you're contaminating. Let's, and I gave her the whole thing. I said, if you're doing that, then you're recontaminating all the service that you just clean. So anyway. So you, maybe the, the cabin fever is setting in. Maybe there will be, you know, some sort of uh, homicide in the big house soon. I don't know. Hopefully we'll, we'll learn to live with each other a little bit better. And speaking of living around the house, being locked down, one of the things that uh, Chiggs and I are doing is um, watching more Netflix, more Amazon Prime, stuff like that. And we've been watching Dispatches from Elsewhere. Oh, and listen. That's the Roomba upstairs. So, it, oh, there's some steps. So she's micromanaging the Roomba upstairs. So we've been watching a lot of different things, like uh, Dispatches from Elsewhere on AMC TV. Really, really got into that. Now, we finally got to the episode where we find out, oh, it's it's a game. It's like an art project kind of thing. Still an interesting series. Like it a lot. And since there's more episodes left to go, there's probably deeper things involved. And so um, I can't get Chigs on board with this, but there are lots of great series on Netflix and um, Amazon that you can you can watch while you're you're under lockdown. If you've never watched any of this, or maybe you have, it's a good revisit. Yeah. Like, for instance, on Netflix, the, the original Twilight Zone. I, I asked Chiggs just last night. I was like, hey, have you ever really watched the Twilight Zones? You've seen them all? She said she probably hasn't. So I think that's next on the agenda. Monty Python's Flying Circus. Yeah, if you like Monty Python, even if you don't, it's just really a absurd comedy lots of times. And um, it's just kind of kind of fun. It's a great series. The Andy Griffith Show. Now, there's only, only five seasons of that you need to watch. All the black and white episodes. Once it goes color, Mayberry just changes. And then, you know, Barney's gone. And the show just isn't as good. I mean... You got these subpar characters coming along like, gosh, I can't stand that one guy's name. What's his name? Howard. Uh, oh, I can't remember. Howard. Anyway, I can't stand him. Can't stand Emmett, the fix-it man. And then Goober steps up because, you know, Gomer's gone. Uh, he's kind of irritating. And then Warren. Huh? 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 And you just want to smack the hell out of him. But anyway, the first five seasons of Andy Griffith, that's all you really need to see. Classic stuff that still makes you laugh. Then some shows that maybe aren't so classic, but Supernatural, I believe, could be considered a classic series because I think it's in its 20th season now or 19th, something like that. Uh, it, it's just, it's a great series and it never lets down and it gets kind of weird at times. Very surreal I just think it's a great, great series. 
It's kind of like right in there with Buffy the Vampire Slayer, that sort of thing. And uh, it's still holding up even after all these years. And I hate to see it in this uh, spring. And then there's Arrested Development. Yes, they went back and uh, sort of restarted the the series again, but it just just wasn't as good. But the first three seasons of Arrested Development, classic, classic, hilarious comedy. Yes, Henry Winkler is the lawyer Barry, just hysterical. And then over on Amazon, yeah, you got Green Acres. Not every episode of Green Acres is available. There's some that you have to uh, purchase to see. And I found out that they've got Third Rock from the Sun. Now, I got to tell you, I was not a fan of Third Rock from the Sun because it just, whenever I would walk into my parents' house and they were watching it, it was just loud, loud. And it was it was sort of annoying. And I, di- I didn't much care for it. And then finally, my friend Allison suggested, like, Eugene, stop putting down the show. It's very bizarre. It's it's very weird how they take a look at things. Like, you've probably never looked at anything like that before. And I was like, all right, all right, just to appease her and shut her the hell up. I will give Third Rock from the Sun a try. And lo and behold, it's a damn funny series. Yeah. It really is. French Stewart, I don't know why he can't open his eyes. And he continued that shtick on those MCI commercials. Yeah, because he was their spokesperson just before cell phones really started taking off. And, uh, you know, long distance was not an issue with cell phones. So those long distance companies just kind of went away. And uh, also, surprisingly, I found out that 30 Rock is on Amazon Prime. Uh, that is a fantastic series, especially if you like Kimmy Schmidt on on Netflix. That series, it's kind of the same vein, the Tina Fey kind of comedy. It's kind of bizarre. I, I loved it all the way through. I kind of came on late on when it was on network TV. I came on about season two or three, and then it just it just hooked me, and I really hated to see that one go. Just a great series. And if you can find it anywhere, I wish somebody would get this streaming again. News Radio. News Radio was a hilarious show. Kind of like in the vein of Green Acres like that. As a matter of fact, they even pay homage to Green Acres in several episodes. Just uh, some great TV to watch right there. So, yeah. And then Chiggs and I started something last night on um, uh, Netflix. And I want to say it's... Babylon Berlin. It's a German TV series. I had never heard of it until I saw it on this list because, you know, a couple of months ago I went looking like different things on Netflix. Like, okay, I'm running out of things to watch. Let me check out the series. Let me see what other critics are saying. And that was one that popped up second on the list. The first choice was not on there. And for the life of me, I can't remember what it is. And I don't have that particular notebook with me. But next on that list was... Babylon Berlin takes place in 1929, you know, just as the um, the Nazis are kind of taking power in Germany, that sort of thing. Uh, it's kind of like a, a detective noir kind of thing. And we watched one episode last night and one episode in, we're hooked. It's kind of, um, if you pay too much attention to it, it's kind of annoying to uh, watch it because it was shot in German. And it's redubbed in English. So try not to pay too much attention to uh, the lips. You know, if you're trying to lip read or something like that. Because that will throw you off. But we started that one episode. We enjoyed it. Then Chiggs decided last night, well, I'm going to go. I'm going to turn in. So I stayed up and got caught up a little bit on Better Call Saul. Which is currently running on AMC in its final season. Another great series there. Also on Netflix. If you've never seen Breaking Bad, God's sakes, what are you waiting for? Sipping NC, the art of drinking, features libations made in North Carolina and beyond, be it wine, spirits, or beer. Hosted by Tim Beeman, Danielle Bull, and Jordan Kuyper, Sipping NC, the art of drinking, is available everywhere you find podcasts and at tldpodnetwork.com. And to give you an update on Lucy today, being Monday as I record this, 
She has had her final prednisone. Is that what it's called? Whatever. She's she's had that final pill. She had her final um, painkiller last night. She seems to be on the mend. Um, we'll know once the effects of these things kind of wear off to see if there's any kind of change in her behavior. And, you know, she kind of goes back. So we're kind of getting over the convalescing period to where we're sleeping in the game room with her. But we've got to find some way to help her get up the bed. You know, steps, she's kind of reluctant with steps because of her arthritis. So I've got to kind of find some way to to get her back on the tall bed. But uh, eventually tonight, I think we're going we're gonna to give it a shot, get her in there. If I have to, maybe I'll pick her up and put her on the bed. Yeah, she can get down herself. She doesn't seem to have a problem with that. But, you know, it's the way it goes. And hey... How about a Cousin Dan story? We've not had a Cousin Dan story in a long, long time. So, why not? This, well, let me go ahead and tell you. We had a cousin exchange program. It was me and Pam. Dan and Paula. They live in West Virginia. A little place called Pickaway in Monroe County. And... What we would do is like sometime during the summer, right around June or something, and then back in August, we would have a cousin exchange program. Paula would come down to North Carolina and stay with Pam, and I would go up to West Virginia and stay with Dan. Well, (laughs) um, here's the funny thing. The first time that we did this, I walked in his bedroom, take in, you know, my luggage and all my clothes and stuff to take into his bedroom because we, we slept in the same bed and I put the stuff down and I noticed there was a bunch of bananas tied to a string that were hanging from a hook in the ceiling. Just maybe, I don't know, two feet over the bed. So I was like, Dan, why do you have a bunch of bananas hanging from the ceiling? He's like, well, you know, I might wake up in the middle of the night hungry. I'll just reach up, grab a banana, eat it, and and just put it in the trash can right there beside the bed. I'm like, okay. (laughs) But considering how the guy sleeps, I mean, he doesn't like to get up. Uh, He's a lot like Chiggs, just doesn't want to get up. I'll, I guess he's still like that. Yeah, I think it's hard for people to change. Uh, me, once I've had about eight hours, I've had enough. I, I can't just lay there uh, with my eyes shut. Um, he liked to do that. Chigs liked to do that. Still likes to do that. So that, you know, maybe that was another thing. He'd, he'd wake up in the morning and just be hungry and have a banana. But we had these cousin exchange programs. It didn't last too long with uh, Paula going down to North Carolina because... Well, she was uh, more or less staying with my sister, Pam. And Pam, um, what's a good way to say it? She can be a stick in the mud. You know, she she can be a real killjoy. And she can be real holier than thou. But if you really know her, and if you're following my sister's blog about her, my other sister's blog. Yeah, they're going for a, a civil war right now. Going through a civil war. Pam is maybe not what she portrays herself to be. And maybe she wasn't that much of a stick in the mud then. And I also think that uh, she was a little jealous because, you know, Paula was, well, Paula still is, very outgoing, you know, attractive. And um, so that bell of the ball syndrome kicked in. You know, oh, you're getting more attention than me. And it just didn't last long, so... It just became me going up there for the summers. And what we would do, we would meet halfway, like Roanoke or something, at a Long John Silver's. We'd all have uh, lunch, dinner, whatever, and then head on back to where we were going. And then when summer was over, we'd meet at the Long John Silver's and, you know, swap cousins again. But one summer in particular, it was the uh, summer of fake blood. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There used to be this stuff. I don't know if you ever heard of the Johnson C. Smith Company. 
they sell like a lot of pranks and uh, little joy, you know, joke stuff like fake dog crap, fake vomit, joy buzzers, all kinds of things, you know, x-ray specs, whatever you, you probably seen them in comic books, stuff like that. Lots of gag gifts, uh, weird uh, conspiracy books, you name it. Mask. Yeah, they would like over the head mask, you know, they'd sold those like crazy. And they used to have this stuff in there called vampire blood. Usually you could find it at a convenience store, you know, in, in, in Greensboro. It was easy for me to find, like Tip Top Grocery on uh, Summit Avenue. Gabriel's also on Summit Avenue. They were opposite ends of the neighborhood where I was growing up. And it was, you know, like a buck a tube or something. And it was nothing. There was, you know, you, you could get rid of this fake blood in a day. So it wasn't very cost effective. Well, Dan and I, we found a way to make it with Cairo syrup. We get some Cairo syrup, which was, you know, maybe at the time, 69 cents for like 32 ounces of the stuff. And all it is is just corn syrup. You know, the clear corn syrup. And we would put in red food coloring with just a hint of brown to kind of give it that that blood burgundy kind of thing. Because, you know, fake blood is very important to a couple of guys that long to be stuntmen. That's right. We were going through that stuntman phase. We wanted to be stuntmen. And we would, we would uh, fake fight with, you know, the blood and stuff. You know, not hit each other. Just, you know, kind of take a swing and then react to it and then spew blood out of your mouth and stuff like that and and then put it on your knuckles. Well, you know, we, we did that. Um, as a matter of fact, that same summer, my grandmother, her house was being built by my uncles. All the uncles came together that summer and they were building her house in uh, Union, West Virginia. Right there on Highway 3, just before you go down the big hill into Union. We had the fake blood, and uh, Dan and I's responsibilities was to fetch different things. Tools, uh, supplies like nails, also uh, shingles, uh, which, by the way, the shingles were very heavy, especially for me. I wasn't quite as, as old or big as Dan. Dan's a couple of years older than me, so... Uh, he had the height and size on me. So we, we had lots of downtime, right? So keep in mind that they're working, you know, putting shingles on this roof. Highway three going into Union was kind of a, a, a busy little thoroughfare, you know, cause it's one of the arteries that leads right into town. You got 219 and you got Highway three that just sort of come together right there. And, <laughs> so we have this, this fake blood. So we put it on us to make it look like we'd just, you know, been in a fight. And we'd stage a fake fight right there next to the road as people were driving in. You know, just make it look like we're beating the hell out of each other. And I remember this car. It, it, if I remember correctly, I know it was a four door and I want to think it was a Ford Fairmont. And it was full of older people, like in their, 60s or 70s and the speed limit right there was coming down from a 45 down to a 35 as you went downhill and they had slowed down to a crawl because they're looking at us and i remember seeing you know them you know kind of oh crap these boys are beating the hell out of each other and then they looked at the top of the house and there's all these these men working on a house that couldn't care less about these two boys out there beating the crap out of each other, throwing blood out of their mouth. And yeah, we would even take like a, a dive into the rocks, you know, like, Ugh! and just kind of spill out onto the rocks. And, oh, that was so much fun, kind of stopping traffic in that little town. And then also we, you know, it was nearing the end of summer. So we've got all the family together at my Aunt Betty's house. That's where my cousin Dan lived. And it, my Aunt Betty's, his mother's. So, makes sense, doesn't it? So we'd have like this big cookout. You know, hot dogs, hamburgers, everybody hanging out, all the family, especially the, the uncles that have been working on this house. And there'd be this big, huge watermelon sitting on the table with, for dessert. 
after everybody was done and the sun was starting to set and it was going to get cooler, there was this watermelon. So I got the idea, hey, let's stick a knife in it and put fake blood around it. So that's what we did. Dan put the knife in there and he dribbled the blood around for dramatic effect where it just kind of dribbled down the sides of the watermelon and we just left it. Of course, you know, we thought that was, you know, the highest form of humor at the time. No one else seemed to care. Yeah, everybody was like, yeah, these boys, these crazy nuts. Anyway, that's the fake blood story that summer. Uh, matter of fact, it was probably some of the best fake blood, some of the best tasting fake blood we ever made. So if you ever want to have fun with your kids or anything like that and you want to make up some fake blood, Cairo syrup, red food coloring, just a hint of um, brown. Because you, you, know, you go too red, it just looks too fake. You know, you got to go for realism, right? Right. Rock 92. Well, good morning to you, Eugene. This is Killer, Killer Ledbetter, the world's most flamboyant boxer. Hey, what's up, Killer? Well, the elections are finally over. The mud slinging is over and done for a while. All them politicians were like a room full of dry queens fighting over the last bit of eyeliner. <laughs> That's a unique way of putting it. Well, Eugene, what did you dress as for Halloween? Me? I don't dress up. A little repressed, huh? <laughs> well, that's no matter. Killer likes Halloween. This year, I went as a monster, created from my own mind. Yeah? It was an abomination that was half pickle and half deer. What in the hell would that be? I was a dildo. <laughs> get it, beefy? <laughs> yeah, I get it. I gotta let you go, Killer. See you later, sweet meat. And now, some more findings in my ACDC symbol intensive rock and roll band study that I'm doing here because I believe that ACDC is probably the most symbol crash symbol intensive band ever in rock and roll. And we have moved up to the Robert John Mutt Lang produced back in black because highway to hell was such a success. They decided to keep the same producer. So there you go. But also back in black marks the um, debut of Brian Johnson as the new lead singer, because um, after the Highway to Hell tour, somewhere along the way, uh, Bon Scott died of, um, hey, let's just put it this way. He um, he drank too much, choked on his own vomit, and he died. So, tragic, horrible, and then Brian Johnson started back with ACDC. Now, not a whole lot of difference in vocal styles, but I will tell you this. My grandmother on my mother's side, she's still with us. And for some reason, I have still yet to run tape on her singing at church. She sounds like Brian Johnson. When she speaks, she sounds like Brian Johnson singing. That's, that's how much of Brian Johnson she sounds like. And I remember one time at church, you know, when I'd have to go all the time with my parents up in West Virginia, it was no big thing. You know, every time she was at church, people heard her sing. They got used to it. No big deal. But in Greensboro, oh gosh, it was a culture shock. I remember people like turning around looking like, who is singing like this? Um, so yeah, she sounds just like Brian Johnson of ACDC. I wish I could get her singing some ACDC on karaoke, but I know she wouldn't do it. I know she wouldn't do it. You know, and I don't mean to make fun of her. She just sounds like Brian Johnson. You know, she just does. And if any of my cousins are listening to this that have heard her sing, then yeah, they know, they know. Anyway, back in black, Hell's Bells, 312 seconds, 186 crashes. That's a crash every 1.7 seconds for 35.3 crash per minute there on Hell's Bells. Matter of fact, let me just eliminate that. I understand that some of you guys don't care about this. I'll just give you the album totals and then I'll put on the um, wheelersdog.com all of my findings so you can look at each song and how it progresses. Now, here are the album titles or totals for Back in Black. The album runs for 2,527 seconds and Phil Rudd, the only drummer on this album, he hits the crash cymbals a total of 1,437 times. Now, that comes out to an album average of a crash every 1.8 seconds. 
that totals out to a 33.3 crash per minute on that album. And that is the number one most crash intensive album from ACDC. The star in my, the star thus far in my research. And it's, it's pretty impressive. Uh, the lowest one here has uh, 68 symbol crashes in it. Uh, I'm kind of shocked about that, but uh, you shook me all night long. For some reason, I thought it would have more than 68 symbol crashes, but that was the lowest. So, yes, Back in Black is now the, the highest album at 33.3 crashes per minute. And I believe Highway to Hell is second with a 25 crash per minute. And then Let There Be Rock, 21.4 crash per minute on that. So again, check out wheelersdog.com, my award-winning blog. And I will get all the results on the there so you can look at them album by album. And, uh, you know, save you some time on this. I hear you. I, I haven't gotten any calls. I've just talked to people personally about it. And uh, this sort of loses their attention. So I think the research is important. I think it's very important. And I can understand where it might bore people. Because science science can be boring. Yeah. I get it. Totally get it. Anyway, guys, we've wrapped this thing up right now. And I do appreciate you listening. My name is Eugene B. Sims. You know, I know we're going through some things here. Uh, people talking about reopening. I think it's a little too soon to do things. And I don't want to get into the whole political aspect of it because we're not here for politics. We just want to have some fun. But folks, just just be safe. Be smart. Take care of yourselves. Treat everything like it's diseased. And everything that you touch, you do. Think of yourself as diseased. You know, clean up after yourself. Now that I'm going to... WTOB, I do that. I clean up before and I clean up after me because, hey, I might be contagious. It takes like 14 days for it to manifest with any kind of symptoms. So, yeah, don't take any chances. Uh, I, I do think we're reopening things a little too soon because Spanish flu what was three waves. Um, so I guess it's inevitable. And, you know, people want to get back to work. People want to get back out. The economy's going for crap, but... Just be smart, guys. Just, just if you don't have to be out there, if you get a risk, don't do it. Don't do it. Anyway, I'm going to get on out of here. Thanks again to Tim Beeman of the Less Desirables podcast and lots of other podcasts he's on in the TLD network. He puts these things together for me so I can put them out. And uh, he also converts it to video, so I do appreciate that. And I am going to get on out of here. Matter of fact, I'm hearing some ribs in the refrigerator that are calling by name. See you cats later.